Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Um, I don't have anything uh, off the top, Matt, so... Really? Only Wednesday? Feel free to uh, kick us off. Uh, okay. Well, I'll just start off with something that I don't think you're going to be able to answer, but I'll ask anyway, because it's a topic of the day. Mm -hmm. um, this plane uh, crash mm -hmm. in Russia, what's your understanding of uh, what happened, if you, if you have one, and do you have any way to independently... Uh, <clears throat> verify or confirm how it went down, what was on it? Uh, I don't have any uh, independent verification to offer um, on any of this uh, at this time. I have seen the public reporting um, and our hope is that uh, relevant authorities uh, investigate um, the reporting to establish some facts around what happened, but uh, beyond that, I don't have any other comments to, to offer or Sorry, perspective and, on this. And the relevant authorities in this case are uh, Russian authorities? Correct. And you're, uh, okay, so and, and you'll, you'll accept what their verdict is? Because Matt. they seem to have already, I mean, the Russian ministry, Russian authorities already have said what, what, what happened. Are you saying that you don't have any reason to doubt? No, that's not at all what I'm saying. I think uh, what I would just say again to take a step back is that we don't have any independent verification uh, to offer on the, the 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 public reporting that's been out there and would just encourage both um, Russian and Ukrainian authorities to um, uh, undertake their own respective investigations and establish facts but I don't have any other comment or perspective to, to offer at this time on this right. thanks Myra. Um, Adams, I just want to ask about NATO enlargement. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously Turkey's parliament approved Sweden's NATO bid yesterday. Now Hungary seems to be the sole uh, holdout. Has there been any outreach from this building or any other building in the administration to the Hungarian <coughs> government over the past couple of days? Uh, recently on this, what have you told them? Have you asked them to speed it up? I don't have any specific engagements uh, to, to, to reach out, to read out to you, Myra. Uh, we, of course, uh, continue to remain in close touch with our, our Hungarian allies, and uh, the Hungarian government itself has publicly said that it supports Sweden's uh, accession uh, to NATO. It's also repeatedly said that uh, Hungary would not be the last uh, to, swat, uh, to ratify uh, Sweden's uh, NATO accession. And so we look forward to uh, Hungary concluding their ratification process, and the alliance will welcoming Sweden into NATO without further delay. And of course, we also welcome the steps that the Turkish parliament uh, took earlier this week. Uh, and we look forward to uh, President Erdogan um, taking whatever steps uh, he needs to within that system for, to formally um, finalize that process, as well as look, we look forward to receiving Turkey's instrument of ratification right. in Washington. I mean, if they had asked you, would you have recommended Hungary to reconvene the parliament a little bit earlier than mid-February? This I is uh, this this is not a, a, a U.S. process. Uh, of course, uh, we view the NATO alliance as critical, uh, but it is not. We are not the only country at the table here, and uh, each respective member of the alliance need to work through their respective processes uh, to get this done. Uh, we, of course, welcome the progress that we saw in Turkey this week, and we look forward to our Hungarian partners also uh, moving along uh, on this process also. Right. And I just note what you say about uh, President Erdogan, like you said, doing whatever he needs to. It's basically, you know, he needs to sign and it needs to be published in the official gazette Correct. and receiving the, uh, the instruments of accession. Can I, is, so is it fair to say that U.S. does not consider this process, Sweden's NATO ratification by Turkey, as complete before all of those things happen? Uh, it's it's not. It's, and it's not just about the U.S. <coughs> opinion or not. I mean, just purely the procedural steps that uh, need to take place. Uh, it's not. Now, that being said, again, this is an, uh, an incredibly uh, welcome step uh, for the Turkish parliament to uh, ratify the accession protocol, and we look forward to receiving uh, Turkey's instrument of ratification in Washington uh, once that process is complete on, on, the, on the Turkish end. Right, and my final one on this is like, once that, once you receive that document, uh, given the administration has openly said that it supports the sale of F-16s to Turkey. Uh, can you commit that the State Department is going to send a formal notification for the F-16s once that process is Completed. I have no uh, timeline to speculate or offer on uh, I'm not from asking here. For timelines. I'm uh, saying, like, 
once that is complete, can you commit? Can the State Department commit? What, what I will, what I will, what I will say, Humaira, is that, and this is uh, no surprise uh, to all of you that have been covering the the State Department and this issue for some time. Uh, President Biden, Secretary Blinken, have been very clear of our uh, support for modernizing Turkey's uh, F-16 fleet, uh, which we view as a as a key investment in NATO interoperability. Um, but beyond that, we also recognize that Congress has a key role in reviewing arms sales, uh, but uh, I'm just not gonna confirm or get ahead of proposed uh, defense sales or transfers until they are formally notified to Congress. Sure, go ahead role in this arms sale, mm -hmm. they are aware that, you know, certain Congress members linked uh, Sweden's NATO with, uh, with uh, the sale of F-16s to Turkey. So based on your engagements with the Congress members, and now that, the, you know, Turkish parliament has ratified, uh, ratif ratified Sweden's NATO bid, do you think that uh, Congress will no longer oppose this sale? Uh, I'm not an employee or a member of Congress, so I'm not going to well, speculate. I, I would uh, just on the just on the other side of Pennsylvania Avenue is a very large uh, white Capitol building, which I'm sure they'd be happy to to speak to you about uh, about this. Look, uh, all, all jokes aside, uh, Congress has a key role in reviewing this sale. I, I'm not going to get into uh, or comment on the proposals until <laughs> those sales have been formally notified. Uh, broadly, though, uh, Congress has an important role to play, and we work with them on a variety of issues that are in front of the State Department, and um, uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to speak to uh, their point of view on this. But again, what I can say from up here on behalf of Secretary Blinken and the State Department is that uh, the steps that the Turkish Parliament took this week were welcome ones. Um, we believe that Sweden is a highly capable defense partner, uh, one uh, that we are ready to welcome into the NATO alliance, and we look forward to um, Turkey finalizing this process as well as our Hungarian partners as well and um, getting uh, welcoming formally welcoming um, uh, Sweden as a member of the Alliance yeah, just one more on that just uh, sure. thank you so do you have anything to say on the you know significance of this you know ratification of Sweden's NATO bit uh, by the Turkish Parliament in terms of the relations between Turkey and the US do I have anything to say what I'm sorry can you speak up Significance of this uh, ratification by the Turkish Parliament uh, in terms of uh, the relations between Turkey and the U.S.? Turkey is a key NATO ally. Um, uh, we believe that Turkey also views the NATO alliance as critical. Uh, they have been um, incredible security partners in the region, not just through the alliance, but uh, outside of that as well. And we look forward to uh, continuing to have a close collaborative relationship with our Turkish partners. As you know, uh, the secretary um, has had regular conversations with Foreign Minister Fidan and um, had the opportunity to meet with President Erdogan a number of times and we will look forward to continuing to work with um, with Turkey in a number of key areas. And as I said, this uh, step that the Turkish parliament took was a welcome one, and we're uh, eager and looking forward to this process continuing. Can I follow up with that? Sure. Thank you. Um, do you expect the Congress to impose any conditions on this prospect sales uh, of F-16s? Uh, and does the administration support include the sale being unconditional. It's starting to sound like a, a little bit of a broken record here, but again, I'm just not going to comment on proposals uh, or proposed defense sales uh, or transfers until they've been formally uh, notified uh, to Congress. Uh, I will reiterate again that Congress has a key role to play um, in uh, in these sales and that Yes, uh, certain members of Congress have publicly said that Turkey's approval of Sweden's application to join NATO is of key interest to them. But uh, beyond that, I would refer you to, to Congress to speak uh, to more of their point of view. Does the administration support this sale being unconditional? This, uh, what this is about, you heard me just talk about this, President Biden, Secretary Blinken view this, uh, the investment, uh, the modernization in Turkey's, of Turkey's uh, F-16 fleet. It is about NATO interoperability, which we believe is critically important to the strength of the alliance, um, as well as uh, strengthening our security overall. Uh, can, you, can you mention about any uh, time limitations, like will Turkey receive in one year, two years, I five have, years? I have no timeline to, to offer or speculate on uh, from here. Anything else on this before we uh, move away to different <laughs> topics? Uh, I'll come. I'll make sure to get to you, Said. Don't worry. Janny, go ahead. Thank you, Vedan. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. 
North Korea launched uh, several cruise missiles into the West Coast mm -hmm. yesterday. Do you think uh, is North Korea's intention behind its uh, series of missile provocations? Uh, I'm not going to get into uh, North Korea's uh, intentions, but uh, to take a step back, Jenny, we again call on the DPRK to refrain from further provocative, destabilizing actions uh, and return to diplomacy. Uh, it's important to remember that the United States, uh, we have been incredibly clear about the fact that we harbor no hostile intent towards the DPRK and uh, continue to be open to uh, diplomacy without uh, preconditions. Uh, this is also uh, an avenue for us to continue to consult closely with uh, the Republic of Korea, with Japan and other allies and partners about uh, how to best uh, engage the DPRK, how to deter some of their aggressive and destabilizing behaviors. And I would also just point you back to uh, the Camp David Trilateral Summit that President Biden hosted um, in the summer as another um, important step that we're taking to, for, to foster closer collaboration uh, with uh, relevant and like-minded partners in the region. The State Department mm -hmm. has always said that, I mean, U.S. always said that uh, it is open to dialogue with North Korea, but the Kim Jong-un blocked all dialogue channel between South Korea and North Korea. If if U.S. were to talk with North Korea, what specific dialogue would be possible? Our, our goal here, Jenny, has, uh, uh, has remained the same uh, over the course of this administration. We uh, are eager to engage in substantive discussions on identifying ways to uh, not just manage military risk, but create lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula, as well as uh, our, our continued stated goal of the complete denu denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Um, and I'll say again, uh, we remain open to engagement on these issues with the DPRK without preconditions. Any dialogue is possible, right? Or you just you just heard me say that we're open to dialogue without preconditions. Right. Nike, go yeah, ahead. Can I please follow up? Does, sure. Does the United States assess the uh, recent moves and rhetoric from North Korea leader Kim uh, has anything to do with the elections? Meaning there are election legislators elections in South Korea this year and there are there is a presidential election in the United States and then can you also comment on um, the demolishment of a significant uh, a major uh, monument that was torn down uh, I'm not going to speculate on on um, theory of the case here Nike what I can say is that we find these kinds of activities uh, destabilizing we find them risky, we find them incredibly dangerous, um, and uh, again, call on the DPRK to return to diplomacy, uh, and we stand ready to engage with them on a number of key issues, and simultaneously, we'll continue to collaborate closely with the ROK and Japan on ways that we can uh, deter the DPRK and strengthen our alliance in the region as well. Uh, Said, go ahead. Thank you. Switching gears yeah. to the Palestinian issue. Uh, first of all, do you have anything, uh, any update on the uh, Palestinian American killed by the Israelis um, a couple of days ago? Uh, I, I have a, a slight uh, update uh, side. We continue to uh, remain in close touch with the government of Israel to understand the circumstances of his death. Um, it's been communicated to us that the investigation will be uh, led by the uh, Israeli National Police, um, and we expect a thorough and expeditious uh, investigation, and uh, we are eager to uh, see the results uh, of what this investigation will find. Um, beyond that, we continue to remain in close touch uh, with the family to uh, offer all appropriate consular assistance, both through the embassy in Jerusalem as well as the Office of Palestinian Affairs. Will there be an investigation by the American security coordinator? I don't have any updates to offer on that. All right. Uh, a couple of things. Mm -hmm. uh, you have any update on you know the, the, the negotiations that are ongoing either in Egypt or elsewhere? Uh, to release the hostages and, and, the, and the prisoners? Our, our hope and our call is for uh, hostages uh, to be released immediately. That's been our call since October 7th. Uh, Hamas could uh, uh, make this easier for everybody and uh, release hostages uh, uh, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So uh, has there been any progress in uh, Britain McGurk's effort as far as you know? 
Uh, I'm sure uh, the White House would be happy to speak at greater length to uh, Brett's travels, but I don't have any updates to offer from here beyond just reiterating, and you've heard the Secretary talk about this quite regularly, that we believe uh, uh, the hostages should be released immediately. We continue to work closely with partners in the Israeli government uh, to do what we can and to help assist in that effort. As you know, uh, a number of American citizens continue to be unaccounted for since October 7th and so we'll continue to work tirelessly um, there is no higher priority than the safety and security of American citizens. Do, do you believe there is any other way other than direct negotiations or you know third way negotiations between Hamas and Israel to release those hostages and the prisoners? Well, the easiest way would be for Hamas to simply just release those hostages and prisoners. I I'm just saying that the Israelis, you know, uh, said all along that they want to do this, they want to free them uh, by force. Do you think that this is still feasible? Do I think what is still feasible? Do you feasible? think that they, they, the Israeli army can't free those hostages? Uh, forcibly, as they have said uh, to begin with. Side, these uh, discussions and conversations are ongoing, and we continue to believe that um, uh, we'll work around the clock in close coordination with the Israelis to do what we can to help this line of work. A Co couple more, if uh -huh. you indulge me. Uh, there are about half a million Gaza Gazans are suffering from acute hunger. Uh, do you have Do you have anything on, on that? I mean, you know, it seems that one out of four trucks uh, is allowed to go in after very tedious kind of in inspection and so on. Um, Said, we have underscored the urgency of the, uh, the dire need uh, for humanitarian aid and other supplies to be allowed into Gaza and to be distributed throughout the Gaza Strip. Um, while certainly uh, immense work has been uh, undertaken, uh, especially by the United States, to enhance and increase the flow of humanitarian aid into Gaza, uh, we know that uh, this is not enough uh, and more needs to be done and we'll continue to work with the government of Israel and other relevant partners to do so. The secretary reiterated this on his travels um, to the region not too long ago in Jordan, where he met with the UN World Food, Gro Food Program to talk about these very uh, key issues. And we'll continue to push uh, for much more humanitarian assistance to enter Gaza, including um, uh, what we believe to be life-saving food products also. So you believe that there are enough steps that, be, that are being taken to prevent a looming famine? That is not, that's not what I said, Said. What I said is, was I was very clear that the steps that have been taken um, have not been enough. We want to see more aid, more food, more life-saving supplies uh, to be allowed to enter Gaza. And finally, I asked you on the artifacts uh, on, on Monday yeah. that the Israeli soldiers stole from the Israel University before blowing it up. It seems that they are showing it in warehouses and so on. Do you have any comment on that? There should, should there be some sort of a commission uh, that can ensure the retrieval of those artifacts uh, stolen by the Israelis? On, on the specific report that you mentioned the other day, Saeed, we still have not been able to verify the specific reports, but to take a step back and to just address the issue of artifacts broadly, not in the context of this specific situation, our view is that cultural artifacts in Gaza should remain in Gaza. But again, the the report that you noted, uh, I, I don't have any um, uh, U.S. government verification to offer on that. Uh, go ahead in the back. <laughs> Yeah. You may have had the chance to see uh, some of the footage uh, shot by our cameraman in the Gaza Strip, widely shared online, showing a group of men um, waving a white flag, representing no threat whatsoever, unarmed, uh, and moving south uh, to try and reach some relatives. Um, the IDF opened fire, uh, as you can see on that video, and killed one of them, uh, Abu Salul. I wonder what your response to that is and whether you think from watching that video whether that potentially represents a war crime. Um, I have seen the, the, that footage, um, but uh, I uh, am not going to uh, comment on the specifics around that, given I'm not aware of the full circumstances on the ground. Um, and as we've said before, this is not um, an American operation. But well, beyond true. that, never, beyond, please you're, don't. You're, you're I, I'm happy to take your questions if you'll allow me. I, if you allow me to, to answer, I don't interrupt you, and I ask you to not do the same. Um, as a general matter, though, we have not parsed our words about the moral and strategic imperative that the government of Israel and the Israeli security forces have to take every effort possible to minimize civilian casualties and minimize impact on civilians. 
as it relates to the footage that your organization ha has shared. Again, I'm just going to refrain from commenting on specific operations as we do not have full circumstances of what on the ground from here. This isn't an American uh, operation. I'm not on the ground there to speak to the uh, full parameters of the situation. It's but not, again, it's not, it's not any a... civilian death, uh, any civilian death is, is heartbreaking and any uh, civilian life lost uh, is, is one too many. And we have made that clear uh, with the Israelis and will continue to do so. Beyond that comment about it being heartbreaking, which is a platitude we often hear, um, are you, would you urge, uh, given that you, you support, broadly support the IDF operations in the Gaza Strip, would you support a Israeli investigation of what happened in that video? That given, is for given that they're waving a white flag and that, they represented no threat. That, that is for uh, the IDF to to undertake and determine uh, based on the circumstances of that uh, situation. What I will say is that we have been clear to uh, our Israeli partners that they need to take every possible measure to avoid civilian harm during an operation and investigate credible allegations of uh, uh, of law or of war violations when they arise. But that is for um, uh, our Israeli partners in the IDF to speak to. Just, just on this, uh, Vedant, you said yeah. that we don't have the full facts or something like that in, in, in a minute. Like, did you, did you actually reach out specifically to Israel about this footage and try to get whatever the facts that I, you guys are seeking? This footage just arrived uh, earlier this morning, so I don't have any specifics of uh, of our diplomatic conversations around it, around this to right, speak well, to. How about the footage that arose last week and the week before and the week before and the week before and the week before, where there have been, you know, if not similar, awfully close instances. Have you ever gotten a, an explanation from the Israelis? Have I'm, you ever gotten a finding from the Israelis of what their investigation, if they promised one? I, I'm not going to speak to uh, private diplomatic conversations, Matt, but this is something that uh, we raise continuously with the Israelis. Uh, the secretary has done so, other officials in uh, our government have done so, and will continue to uh, to do it. Okay, well, uh, have you ever gotten an answer from the Israelis? I, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to speak to the, the privacy of certain diplomatic conversations, Matt, but we have been clear that there is a moral and strategic imperative to take as many steps as well, possible that, to minimize civilian that, that's casualties. That's fine, that's fine that you say that, but then when you are asked specific questions like this relating to specific footage, uh, and this is not the first time that this has happened. You've been asked repeatedly about this, and then you always, you come back and say, well, we've raised questions with you. We've asked the Israelis questions. Have you ever gotten a response to any of those? We these conversations. I'm not are, asking you for the details. I just want to. Know we have you've these the conversations are private. You we have. have raised with the Israelis specific circumstances, and we have uh, you received have gotten answers. Correct. I'm not going to speak to those uh, what, conversations right say, now. In any case, are you aware of that the Israelis say mm, we screwed up here? I'm just not going to speak to the private conversations, Matt. Yeah. Since you, you know, it sounds like you haven't had a chance to ask about this one. Are you planning? to ask about this particular instance or no? I'm just not going to speak to specific diplomatic conversations. What I will just reiterate, Humaira, is that we talk to our Israeli counterparts all the time, regularly, um, from various interlocutors across our government, and we'll continue to do so. And front and center, uh, part of those engagements will continue to be the moral and strategic imperative that our Israeli partners have uh, to minimize the impact on civilians. Leon. Yeah, but then just in the same line of question, yeah. do you have any comment, uh, reaction to the um, UNRWA saying that uh, a UN shelter was uh, shelled uh, by tanks in uh, Kanyunis uh, today, killing nine people? Uh, they say, well, it's a UN shelter. They're calling it a blatant uh, violation of the rules of it, war. It's incredibly you, concerning. Incredibly concerning, Leon. Uh, and we deplore today's attack on uh, the UN's Khan Yunus Training Center. Um, you've heard me say it before, you've heard the Secretary say it before, but uh, civilians must be protected and the protected nature of UN facilities must be respected. And humanitarian workers uh, must be protected so that they can continue providing civilians with the life-saving uh, humanitarian assistance um, that they need. So, and so have you asked the Israelis to look into this? 
we, I'm not, Matt, I'm not going to read out every single uh, uh, conversation that we have with the Israelis or read out every every issue that happens. I don't think you're asked, being or asked every, about every single Or every issue that happens in the region. Look, that, you've been like, like, twice here in the last three minutes, you've been asked about two specific incidents. Have you raised? <clears throat> we continue one? to raise with the, our Israeli partners the need and the responsibility that they have to protect uh, UN facilities and to protect humanitarian workers so that they can continue to carry out and conduct uh, the life-saving work that they're doing Look, in the region. I, I think you, you need to go back to NEA or whoever is in charge of this and get and get a definitive answer about whether you're asking about specific incidents. We and, are and, asking, we are asking yeah, and engaging well then, about specific then, incidents, then, Matt. I'm okay. not going well to specifically read them out to you from up here. You, if they respond to you, you need to come back and tell us what they say and if they don't respond to you which it sounds like you're may very well be the case you should say that matt certain conversations uh diplomatic conversations sensitive tough diplomatic conversations uh are best kept private uh i assure you though we are <clears throat> raising these issues directly with our israeli counterparts uh, and we'll continue to do well, so that assurance doesn't Thank mean you. a whole hell of a lot if you're not able to say that you've gotten any response to i mean you are the biggest supporter of the israeli government not you personally but you know the united states is and, and if you can't, if you ask questions about troubling incidents, which you, you said, just said that this one on in Khan Yunus was incredibly concerning and we deplore the attack. If you can't get an answer from them on this, what, what, you know, what, what, what does that say about where, what the U.S. Matt, we'll intend to ha continue to have these conversations with the Israeli government and raise these very tough uh, and difficult situations. Um, DR, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Iraqi Foreign Minister in a post said that we received a, a very important letter from the U.S. government, and we will discuss that very important letter. I understand that you are not going to talk about the details of that letter, but in general, what, what correspondence, what message do you have for the Iraqi government about these militia groups that are attacking you every day and also you are attacking them? So, um, we continue to remain in close touch with uh, the uh, Iraqi government and have been very clear that these uh, Iran-aligned militia groups that continue to put uh, not just coalition forces but also Iraqi forces in harm's way uh, need to be held account um, and the United States will take uh, appropriate um, action to do so. As you're so tracking, DR, on Tuesday night, U.S. military forces conducted necessary and proportionate strikes on three facilities used by KH and other Iran-aligned militia groups uh, in Iraq. Uh, these strikes are a direct response to a series of escalatory attacks on U.S. and coalition forces uh, in Iraq and Syria. If, if, I'm not sure if you saw the Iraqi government statement, statement on that. What they say, they condemn your attack and they say this attack is the determine the, the security and stability in Iraq and it's an aggressive act. So if you are there on the Iraqi invitation, so why you don't have any coordination and cooperation with the Iraqi government to face these groups in a way that the Iraqi government tells you this is unacceptable and this undermines the cooperation and coordination between us and the United States. Let, let me say a couple things here. First, uh, U.S. military forces remain in Iraq uh, and we're there working alongside Iraqi military forces. We are there at the invitation of the Iraqi government in order to ensure the enduring defeat of ISIS. I will also note that there is absolutely no equivalence between the steps that the United States um, has taken to protect Iraqi and coalition personnel uh, between the strikes that Iranian-aligned militia groups are undertaking in Iraq. Uh, again, we are defending ourselves, defending our personnel, and uh, Iranian-aligned militia groups are targeting civilians. Are you violating the Iraqi sovereignty, which, way, which they are saying that, the Iraqi government says that? Again, I will just say we are in Iraq at the invitation of the Iraqi military, and we will not hesitate to take take appropriate steps to protect our personnel as well as the personnel of Iraqi military forces as well. Nigeria. Yeah, Nigeria. Alex, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll work through them, don't worry. Thank you. I have ahead. a couple, please uh, bear with me. Uh, staying on Iran, Iran uh, yesterday killed another protester. 
uh, Mohammed Agobat law. Will Iran face any reaction, accountability? We condemn again the Iranian regime's use of the death penalty to punish people for what we believe to be just exercising their human rights. Uh, there have been, Alex, widespread reports of torture, forced confessions, and restrictions on legal counsel. All of this, we believe, undermine any shred of credibility in the decisions handed down uh, by Iranian courts. Uh, the U.S. will continue to take actions to support the people of Iran in, in practical ways, both seen and unseen. Uh, in close coordination with our allies and partners in the region as well. You still haven't uh, sanctioned Iran's supreme leader for gross human rights violations. You had Magnitsky sanctions last month. Was it a missed opportunity? Uh, Alex, I'm just not going to preview any actions from up here, and I will just note that when it comes to holding the Iranian regime accountable for its malign activities, including its repression of its own people, we will not hesitate to take action. We have a pretty clear track record of doing so. Thank you. And in New York, uh, Russia and Iranian foreign ministers met and they called for ceasefire uh, in Gaza. What did you make of the fact that uh, now Iran angle is one angle, but Russia uh, keeps murdering Ukrainian civilians even, even as we speak, calls for ceasefire in the Middle East? As it relates to uh, Israel's ongoing um, uh, efforts in, in Gaza, a ceasefire is not a policy that we're pursuing. It's not the first time you've heard me say this. Uh, we continue to believe that it is critically important that steps be taken to degrade Hamas so that uh, uh, tragedies like uh, October 7th cannot be uh, repeated over and over again. Can Gita, go ahead. I'll, I'll come back to you, Alex. I'll wait for a minute. Gita, you've had your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. The president has been uh, disqualified for taking part in the elections for the um, assembly of experts. I was wondering if the U.S., uh, if the administration or the State Department has any opinion on that. Do you see a crack uh, in the uh, system? Well, on the assembly of experts decision, I really don't have any specific comment to offer, Gita. But... Uh, to be clear, the world has recognized for some time now that Iran's political system features uh, undemocratic and non-transparent administrative, judicial, and even electoral systems. Uh, we also have no expectation that Iran's upcoming parliamentary elections will be free and fair. Uh, thousands of parliamentary candidates were already disqualified uh, in November uh, through uh, what we believe to be an opaque process. Uh, and simply, uh, this is the same kind of things that we can expect from an end, from an undemocratic regime uh, that suppresses its own people to retain its own grip on power. Now, on uh, the foreign minister of the same yeah. government that you're talking about, uh, the administration gave him a visa. He came to New York. He blasted the U.S. on the same day that they executed two people. Um, I was wondering if, if, at the same time, it seems like the U.S. is in a proxy war with Iran through the Houthis and, and the Iraq and those groups in Iraq. How much longer is the Biden administration going to allow Iranian diplomats to come to the United States? Let me let me unpack that in a couple of ways. First and foremost, as it relates to the other things going on around the world, uh, the United States is certainly not interested in seeing uh, any kind of escalation in the steps that we've taken. Um, whether it be in the Red Sea or in other parts, uh, have been uh, about uh, deterrence, defense, and degradation, and ensuring that malign groups are held accountable. Uh, but coming back to the UN, Gita, uh, let me just be very clear about something. Uh, Iran is an adversary. It is the world's largest exporter of terrorism. Um, it has a clear and potent track record of destabilizing behavior, not just in the Middle East, uh, but elsewhere. It is a serial human rights violator. And uh, nothing has changed about our our approach to Iran. Um, and when it comes to Iranian diplomats and the foreign minister's presence at the UN, uh, while specific um, visa records are confidential, uh, we take our responsibility as the host of the United Nations uh, and our obligations under the UN headquarters agreement, we take those things very seriously. And so while we uh, may not love uh, hosting Iranian diplomats on American soil. Uh, it is a responsibility that we believe to be consistent with the obligations that we have as the host country with the United Nations. Uh, but broadly, uh, our approach to the Iranian regime and the steps that we will take to hold them accountable, uh, both 
uh, unilaterally, but also in close coordination with allies and partners, has not changed. But there is precedence that visa was not um, issued to anyone and diplomat, foreign minister, basically. And at that time, the relations, the situation was not this bad, uh, you know. The two countries were not at each other's throats. So when the situation is so much worse right now, um, how, how can you uh, issue visas, even given your obligations to the uh, UN? It, it is because of that obligation, and we take that obligation very seriously. I'm not going to speak to specific circumstances or specific diplomats, as visa records are indeed confidential, Gita, but uh, this is a responsibility we take seriously, and simultaneously we continue to view Iran as an adversary, and we'll continue to take steps to hold them accountable. Yeah. The guy actually shows up on U.S. soil, right? Are you going to say that you denied him a visa and he just showed up illegally? I think it's fair to assume, Matt. Exactly. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, the U.S. president was interrupted around eight times in a speech by protesters calling for a ceasefire. This is happening at home. Does this concern you uh, about how the U.S. is viewed in the region, in the Middle East, and does this also, how do you think this would affect the U.S. leverage in the region, in the Middle East? Uh, the secretary, as you know, um, is, uh, is on travel on the African continent now. He, uh, earlier in the month, was on travel um, in the Middle East region. Since uh, the October 7th attacks, he has visited the region four times. Um, and on every trip, uh, what the secretary and the traveling team hears consistently from uh, countries uh, around the region, um, some of whom may um, have different points of view on specific policies uh, that we are pursuing or have different points of view on specific pieces of this conflict, have uh, talked about how important American diplomacy has, in, has been and the indispensability uh, of the role that American diplomacy has played. Uh, I will remind you that it was American diplomacy that allowed uh, humanitarian aid uh, to be able to flow uh, into Gaza. It's been American diplomacy that has allowed for the safe departure of uh, f more than 1,400 um, American citizens, legal permanent residents, and eligible family members. Um, and over the course of this process, we will continue to engage, not just with the government of Egypt and the government of Israel, uh, but other regional partners, including the Kingdom of Jordan and others, um, on this very important issue. Uh, but what we're hearing on the ground is that leaders want to see uh, the Americans and this building, our government, engage more, not less. Uh, Sorry, one, one more question. Sure. Uh, it, it has been your assessment that Hezbollah uh, doesn't want a wider uh, war on the northern borders. But do you think that the Iranian, given what's happening in the Red Sea and on the Lebanese front, do you think that the current, they want the current situation, they don't want to go back to October 6? I mean, I mean, war on a small scale. Um, I couldn't possibly speculate what uh, the I Iranian suppose. regime uh, wants or doesn't want. But what I can say, if we just sort of take some of these, um, take some of these actions, uh, the ac ac actions that they're taking, or that the actions that Iran-aligned uh, militia groups are taking, um, are contributing to greater destability <laughs> and risk in the region. Let's take the example of the Red Sea. This is a vital waterway which uh, has. 15% uh, of all seaborne trade flowing through those waters, 30% of all container uh, shipping flowing through those waters. When international vessels uh, performing legitimate commerce flowing through those waters are put under risk, are put under, in, put under danger, str firing on those vessels does nothing um, to help Palestinian civilians. It does nothing to uh, uh, create better stability better integration in the reason, region. In fact, it does the opposite. We're putting a, a further burden on international commerce, uh, making things uh, pricier, making uh, goods more difficult to get to their final destinations. Um, Doc, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah. 
on Nigeria. Given that Christians represent 46% of Nigeria's population, what steps did Secretary Blinken take this week while in Nigeria to demand Christian persecution in Nigeria stop in exchange for aid since more than 52,000 Christians have been butchered for being Christians since 2009 and over 100 Nigerian Christians were slaughtered in December of last year? This is a, according to a recent Fox News report. And why the silence on this? So we we'll con uh, we continue uh, to carefully monitor the religious freedom situation in every country, country including of course uh, Nigeria. And a key component of our diplomacy is uh, engaging not just with uh, government entities, but also outside groups, uh, humanitarian organizations, and civic society leaders. And we'll continue to do so. Well, a follow up is what are Secretary Blinken's re reasons for not placing? Nigeria on the countries of particular concern at CPC list? Uh, the assessment was made that the country did not uh, meet the threshold for uh, designation, but Doc, I'm happy to check if we've got more specifics Thank and you. get back to you. Go ahead. International Day of Education, and nowadays in Afghanistan, more than a million girls and women are banned from school and university by Taliban. Just, I wanted to know who are watching this uh, press briefing, and I um, wanted to know what you have to say to them at this specific day. Uh, what, what I will say is that uh, the U.S. It will continue to work tirelessly uh, to ensure that um, uh, and, and hold to account the, the Taliban for the very uh, uh, egregious human rights uh, violations that we continue to see uh, taking place. Um, and uh, that's something that we'll continue to work in close coordination for. A number of officials um, uh, in our department are deeply engaged on this issue in addition to the secretary, including our uh, envoy, one of our envoys for this issue, Rena and Mary. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah. The Financial Times reports that U.S. is asking China, China to urge Iran to rein in Houthi's stop attacks on shipping in Red Sea. Uh, do you have any other details? or this conversation with the China? I don't have any specific diplomatic engagements to, to offer, but it is in the interest of any major economy, including, of course, the PRC, to uh, uh, make sure that these waterways are a place for responsible, safe, uh, and legitimate international commerce to take place. You just heard me um, uh, say to one of your colleagues, these are vital waterways where 30% of container shipping happens, 15% of seaborne trade. It is in the interest of any country to make sure that these waterways are safe uh, so that goods that are getting to places around the world, sometimes often to places with vulnerable populations, uh, can get these uh, these these products. The OIC, Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation, expressed concerns over the construction and inauguration of the temple at the site of Raised Barbary Mosque uh, in India. Uh, many other countries also raising their concerns, uh, terming it a violation of uh, religious freedom. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, look, we l strongly support um, freedom of expression and the freedom of uh, religion or belief for all. We also uh, are continuing to monitor uh, the religious freedom situation in uh, countries around the world. Sir, after the killing of Hadith in Najjar and uh, failed assassination attempt on uh, Pandu, Mr. Pandu here in U.S., the Six for Justice are holding Khalsa referendum uh, here in the U.S. The voting is to be held on January 28 in San Francisco. So I remember you told us that it's a matter of free speech, but what is your position on the official Khalistani referendum here in the U.S.? Uh we're just not going to comment on uh, what is an unofficial referendum, but uh, let me just say our relationship with India is an important strategic and consequential partnership, and we're looking forward to working with India in a number of key important issues going forward. Go ahead. Yeah, excuse me. Uh, I have two questions related to Egypt. Uh, like today, the Egyptian president, Mr. Sisi, uh, like he said officially, he swore in, uh, uh, like in conference that Egypt is not uh, principle for preventing aid uh, to get from uh, Rafah to uh, uh, Gaza. And Israel in international court, like they blamed Egypt that, or like implicitly that they are not responsible for, or like they are not preventing any aid coming from Rafah to Gaza. So what is your like perspective as a country, as USA in this, uh, this agreement? Like who is responsible for letting the aid, uh, like not just 200 trucks, like uh, uh, appropriate number of trucks for aid, humanitarian aid to get in Gaza. Is it Egypt or is it Israel? Both are blaming each other now officially 
about who is responsible for preventing this aid. And you, as a country, keep saying that you are care about humanitarian, you need like more aid coming in and stuff like that. But both are blaming each other and both are ally with USA. So who is responsible about this uh, aid? The second thing, officially Egypt as well, like warned or urged Israel to not occupy the Philadelphia axis. While the Israeli perspective is to uh, occupy the uh, Philadelphia axis, which is like the border between Gaza and mm -hmm. Rafah. And the uh, U.S. perspective, what do you think is better for solving this uh, conflict? Right. Is like Israeli I, occupying I, I the Philadelphia axis yeah. or like, no, like stay away of this? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in because I understand what you're asking and want to make yeah, sure to get questions. to other people. I, I know. Yeah, I cool. heard the two questions. Um, First, let me just say this. It's important to remember, Rafa border crossing is not uh, American border crossing. It's not a crossing which we control. Uh, that being said, uh, both the government of Egypt and the government of Israel are important uh, and key partners and conduits for not just uh, the entrance of humanitarian aid uh, to flow into Gaza, but also for the safe mobility and departure of American citizens and other uh, nationals who may be interested um, in uh, departing Gaza. And we'll continue to work closely with both countries on both of those pieces. Uh, separately, um, on your next question, I think the secretary was quite clear in the principles and outlines lines he laid out um, in Tokyo in the in the fall, uh, which is that we uh, do not want to see any reduction in um, Gazan territory, and we certainly don't want to see any reoccupation of uh, Gaza from Israel either. We believe that these are two pieces um, that would be anti run counter to what we hope to see for the region and take us further away from um, greater peace and stability. Yeah, so you, you are blaming Israel that they are not letting the uh, like uh, humanitarian aid to that's not what I said okay that's so not I, what I okay. said I so, so 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 how we solve this problem of letting the appropriate final uh, appropriate humanitarian aid to get in Gaza like Two of your allies are blaming each other. This like, is something that we are continuing to work uh, around the clock uh, in close coordination with the government of Israel and uh, the government of Egypt. Um, I will also just note for you that on January 23rd, 185 trucks with food, <laughs> medicine, and other supplies. I'm not saying it's enough. What I'm saying is that 185 trucks with food, medicine, and other supplies entered Gaza, and we're going to continue to work with the government of Israel and the government of Egypt. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, on this very key and important issue. Yeah, yeah, but you I'm going to move on. Like, yeah, I've given you two questions. I'm going to okay, go to some of your like, like, I'm going to move. Go ahead, sir. I uh, wanted to go back a bit, uh, for, to North Korea, uh, specifically the missiles that they're um, transferring to Russia. In a joint say, statement from a couple of weeks ago, uh, you said that uh, Russia's use of DPRK ballistic missiles in Ukraine provides valuable technical and military insights into the DPRK. And so um, can you say anything wha about what you've learned about it uh, and, and about the effectiveness and the effect that the, this, these mis missiles have uh, had on the ground? Let me say a couple of things. First, deepening cooperation uh, and the unlawful arms transfer between uh, Russia and the DPRK is something that uh, should be of great concern to anyone interested in maintaining peace and stability across Europe as well as the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we also believe that uh, it is important to anybody who is interested in upholding the global non-proliferation regime and supporting the people of Ukraine as they defend uh, their freedom. Uh, but it is also something that we are uh, paying close attention attention to and will continue to watch uh, for in terms of developments. Uh, it's clear that uh, the Russian Federation, Mr. Putin, stands ready to benefit from the relations with the DPRK um, as uh, they are not only getting uh, ballistic missiles for use in Ukraine, but also artillery shells. Uh, so this is something we're watching very closely and we're also monitoring North Korea's own pursuit of advanced military capabilities uh, as well. And have you, um, have, have you had any indications that uh, uh, you know, North Korea has got received something from Russia for for these. Uh, I don't have any uh, updates to offer. Nike, uh, then Alex, and we're gonna wrap. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, do you have any update on the Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty journalist Alsu Kermal Shafo? Um, has Alsu been granted U.S. consular visits? 
Yes. Uh, we are following closely the detention of Alsu Kuramasheva in Russia. Uh, we remain incredibly concerned about the extension of her pretrial detention. Uh, I will, can also note that our request to visit her was denied on December 20th. Uh, the U.S. Embassy in Moscow continues to seek appropriate consular access. Uh, but uh, as we have said before, when it comes to uh, dual nationals who may be detained or arrested, Russia has no legal obligation to inform us uh, of the detention of U.S. citizens who are dual nationals. Uh, Russia has uh, acknowledged her detention to us, to consular officials, uh, but again, our, our request for consular access continues to be denied. Thursday marks the 100 days since she has been deta uh, detained. Is the State Department closer to designate her case as wrongfully detained? I have no updates to, to offer on any specific designation, but we have no higher priority than the safety and security of U.S. citizens overseas. Alex, go ahead. Very quickly on, on that one, then I have another follow-up on Russia. Uh, uh, on December 20th, on what ground did they deny? Did they give an explanation? Did they deny you a cancel? I, I don't have any additional specifics to offer. And there's a reason why the U.S. has levies on <coughs> to impose against this such a behavior. Will you take any sanctions against Russia if they keep denying your cancel request? Uh, I'm not going to preview or speculate any actions from up here. Okay, and another question on Russia. Uh, does the department take any issue with the fact that Apple company just paid uh, $13 million to Russian state budget? The very budget that is being used in Ukraine to murder and terrorize Ukrainians. Uh, I don't. That's uh, something that you would have to speak to the company about. Okay, but, thanks, this, everybody. This a, uh, green reminder, just, just a quick follow up. Green rem reminder to why activists believe that the State Department should impose uh, certain business advisory on Russia against. Uh, on American, you know, companies. Alex, we have not hesitated uh, since Russia's unjust invasion. Uh, we have not hesitated to use the various arsenals that exist in the U.S. government to hold the Russian Federation ag account. Uh, that includes through sanctions, export controls, and other steps. And I'm certainly not going to preview anything uh, else from up here. All right. Thank thanks, you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you.